We're here for the uh, Q&A and screening of the uh, Little Crackers project on Sky. And uh, I'd like to welcome, we've got Saskia Schuster, who's a commissioning editor. And we've got Damon Beasley, who was producer of Sharon Hogan's film. Yep. And uh, we've got Mustafa, who did the Jason Manford project. And also we have um, Adrian Bate, who worked with Paul O'Grady on this film. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with Little Crackers, so it um, might be worth Saskia if you could just tell us a tiny bit about, about uh, what the they project. Are. Yeah. Sure. So we, um, on Sky One, it's become a little bit of a Christmas institution. We have a strand called Little Crackers, which um, <laughs> tend to be about 12 um, little autobiographical tales from big comedy talent. Um, it's been our third year of doing it, and um, this year we made three of those in 3D. So they were simulcast on Sky One in 2D and on our 3D channel. So do you, look, do you yourself go out and pick who's going to make a film or, or we, do it? it? It comes from a different, well, various approaches. We, yes, yeah, sometimes we talk directly to talent and see if they want to do one. Sometimes it comes from production companies saying, we've got relationships with X, Y, and Z, are you interested? Mm. Um, so yeah, from a variety of sources. Yeah. And it's not, um, it's not always been 3D, has it? You've, you've done, no. the, the history is sort of 2D. So why did you decide to, uh, make these films in, in, in 3D, I suppose. Well, Sky's got a real commitment to 3D, and as I say, we've got 3D channel. Um, and comedy, we haven't really sort of, this is a really, um, this is the early stages of our learning curve um, in 3D. And we, we, I think, were a little bit guilty of being a bit, I don't know, a, a little bit sort of short-sighted in what 3D could offer to the genre. And I think initially we, I think we, our commissioning team, sort of thought, well, can see the benefits of physical comedy in 3D, but beyond that, not really sure, will it make it funnier, will it get in the way, will it distract? And I think the more we sort of looked into it and thought about it, we realised that actually careful use of 3D can really serve the joke, it can really heighten um, atmosphere and emotion, and you can undercut that, and you can, you can be more playful with it than I think we were at first realising. So, um, because we do have ambitions to create more um, comedy content for our 3D channel, it felt like um, the format of Little Crackers, which are these 10-minute films, felt like a very good sort of starting place, um, both for productions to learn and, and for us. So, it's not just uh, Little Crackers that you're looking at, at producing in 3D, it's sort of, it, it, it's across other films and series as well yeah no we we have we have 3d ambitions yeah okay well um i think we should get straight in to the first film and this is uh, mustafa um i wonder if you'd like to say a little bit about the about the clip for it yeah uh can you hear me yeah. it's uh, it's a story uh, based on uh, jason manford the comedian uh, looking back on his life uh, when he was 12 years old, when he had to go to hospital for a, a circumcision. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's 12 minutes long and it's, it's fun and I hope you enjoy it. What was the process in terms of uh, working with Scott? Was he, um, did he just come to you with a script or did uh, um, you have any input in, in... You mean Jason? Jason, sorry. <laughs> um, I think uh, the lovely, awesome guys at Left Bank Pictures, uh, they, the process, they saw a few directors and they settled on me in the end. It's because of my love of kids and comedy and action and adventure, and that kind of 80s uh, stuff that I love, like Goonies and, and all those other films. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, when, I, when I was looking at the script, I think it was, it, you know, it was, uh, I had lots of freedom. I think Jason and the guys at Left Bank uh, were very open to my creative ideas and what I wanted to do with it. And I understood that this was a Christmas cracker, a little cracker playing at Christmas. So I really wanted it to uh, be magical and connect with the audience and, and, and make them have that warm feeling, you know? 
so and, uh, and were there changes that you were there any changes that you made to the scripts where you thought <coughs> oh let's do it differently because of the 3D in particular yeah definitely I mean uh, it was really interesting actually dealing treating this in, in a 3D way because uh, I guess you know because it's a drama and because it's comedy it's like how you know where can we do this how can we push this how can we make this uh, interesting and then when we looked at it we were like, oh my god there's so many different ways of doing this you know the hospital is all in corridors and it's all in square places and, and, and if you watch the start of the film the camera moves with the characters and it's always moving and gliding and moving and gliding and uh, we, we, look, we took a lot of research on uh, Stanley Kubrick and his one perspective and we kind of shot things in that kind of three dimensional space so that it was more immersive for the viewer so those corridor scenes which you haven't seen there are very much like that. And uh, also I think uh, I, I watched the video of Avatar and James Cameron and his live action stuff, uh, not the 3D stuff, just to see how he dealt with the 3D. And uh, a lot of it was very subtle, because there's two ways of doing 3D, right? There's the kind of subtle, immersive way where it's not too much in the eye and if you, you know, it's not heavy, 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 where it kind of just fits in and, and you kind of sink into that world. Then there's that other sort of 3D which kind of pops up at you. Uh, and uh, I guess that's like the spider clown scene you just saw there, which is really fun. And I thought, you know, this is a kid's comedy uh, with romance elements, etc. But for those scary bits for kids, you know, we could make those spider clown arms come out of the screen and really, uh, you know, uh, be really fun for young audiences and family audiences alike. So, so I think there was lots of scope to have a lot of fun with it. And also to, to uh, deal with it in, in a very uh, smart way. You know, we didn't want to pound your head and, and all these, you know, 3D stuff throwing, you know, flying out the screen at you because it would just be a headache, you know, to watch, you know, no 3D film is like that, you know. But, you know, if you treat 3D in a very clever way, it could really enhance your viewing uh, experience. And I hope I'd, I'd done that and I hope I achieved that with the film. Yeah. So in terms of... Um uh, how, uh, at what stage of the production you did most of your learning? Because this is the first 3D project you've done. Yeah. yeah. Um, was most of that done in pre-production, or was it, you know, really once you got on set that? Yeah, because learning? you know I hadn't done 3D before, and uh, the lovely people at Sky and Sony they put us on like a two-day, was it two-day? No, sorry, one-day, really intense kind of course workshop where we looked at 3D and, and, and how uh, 3D worked and depth and camera and all the technical aspects. And I guess that really grounded us uh, and the vision. Of course, we had a 3D team as well uh, throughout the shoot who, who, who took care of uh, the technical side on set. So for me as a director, it didn't really affect that much. But because off, after, after that uh, initial day of uh, looking into, into 3D and, and figuring out how it worked, etc. Then I was really, I, I was, I, I understood its constraints and its possibilities. And that's when I went back and sat down with the DOP, who was also on that day of training, and started figuring out, look, how can we do this? How can we make this fun? How can we do this with 3D? How can we utilize it to, uh, to its maximum potential? But was, the, was most of that planning and done before you got on set or once you got on set? Oh, it was just... before, it was absolutely, it was all before set, you know. Everything, or, you know, we, we specifically chose the spider scenes and, and how we were going to shoot the corridor scenes and how the space was going to move away before the set. Because it's all, it's all down to planning, you know, yeah. uh, I think with any film. Uh, the more planning you do, the better it is. And uh, Damon and Adrian, did you find the same thing? Was it all very meticulously planned out before, before you started shooting? Yeah, I mean, for me, that was one of the big attractions because I'm sort of slightly anal logistically like that. And I, I think what, what, what was really... I like that discipline of having to put so much preparation in, A, because we were all terrified that it would probably not be as quick as everyone had told us, but it really helped. Um, it just, you know, focus on the shots and what you're going to do. And I suppose in comedy, a lot, a, a lot of comedy... Uh, direction or a lot of comedy shooting you really aim for coverage you really want to get as much out of your day as possible it's really frustrating to turn up on the set if you're a producer and your director hasn't planned a shot or he hasn't planned a scene and you're trying to work it out and you can see the day going away so I think you know the fear factor uh, and you know for the other reasons that you were talking about technical reasons that 
enforce that discipline. I, I love that, actually, as a, as a, and, as a producer. And specifically, um, Adrian, did you find that the, the planning had to be more intense um, going into the 3D project um, than it would be? Yeah, but we, we said from the start that we didn't want 3D to dominate, dominate what the film was trying to do, uh, but rather it would always enhance it. I mean, I, I like, like the others, I was a kind of 3D virgin and, and had to go on the Sony boot camp and came back and, and sort of started to understand. But I actually decided I didn't actually want to understand every nuance of 3D because I wanted to always sort of keep my pulse on, on basically the drama, the script, the comedy. Because like everybody else, we had a fantastic 3D team from OnSite and Sony. <laughs> Uh, and, and I knew, I felt very confident, and confident that they were going to be there to come forward and say, look, if you do that, this will happen. So we always had a guiding, we, we had kind of mentor, 3D mentors with us. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what we did perhaps differently is we recognised, we looked at the script and we kind of recognised the points in the script which had real relevance and could be enhanced by 3D. Um, we storyboarded all those, mm -hmm. um, and those storyboards became invaluable because they sort of became a currency in every production meeting, in every creative meeting, in every practical meeting. Those, those, those storyboards would be displayed and, and, and became a sort of Esperanto for, for 3D. Hey, right. And just, just very quickly, how different are 3D storyboards? Are you modelling or anything like that, or they, do they just look like 2D storyboards? Well, to be honest, we never had them, so we didn't, we didn't really get on to doing 3D storyboards. Um, no, so. I think our storyboards are pretty much like 2D storyboards, except you could look at the frame and you could talk about the depths that you were working with. The, the DOP, um, Stu, Stu Bentley, our DOP, was like a kid in a toy, sh uh, kid in a toy shop. I mean, he actually loved immersing himself in every facet of 3D. Uh, and, and as I say, it would become like a currency. It wouldn't, it wouldn't actually represent, obviously, it's going to be very difficult to have a 3D storyboard. Yeah. Uh, they're obviously in, in, in 2D, but they became invaluable aid, we felt, for key moments in the film that we wanted to sort of maximise um, the use of 3D. Okay. Well, maybe we could show a, a clip, well, maybe we will show a clip from uh, your film with Paul O'Grady. Can you give us a bit of context? What was, the, uh, what was his story? Um, well, like all, the, I think all the crackers, um, it, it's it looking from an event in, a, in, in, um, in their lives. And he relates an event which he said that it was very easy because he wrote it in 10 minutes. He claims. <laughs> I don't think he, I, I think it took him at least half an hour because it's, it's a half hour film. Um, but he does write very fast. But he remembered a time when he, was, um, when he was 17 or 18 and he went to see The Exorcist and was scared out of his, seriously scared out of his wits. And so the film becomes quite a sort of, uh, starts with a quite a conventional narrative uh, and then sort of goes into the realms of, of, of kind of almost horror um, as he meets various characters that come to haunt him both from the film and his past. All right, okay. And so how did you, did you uh, choose a director yourself within the company or was that all? No, so, uh, Sprout Pictures who made it very much kind of, I suppose, brought Peter Catanio um, and myself in to, to, uh, to sort of hand, handed the script over to us really. Um, and working with Paul Jackson as our exec um, obviously was a, a, a fantastic resource to have in terms of, again, a, a sort of comedy mentor. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and and what, what, so what sort of support did you have then if, if, if you were going into this not really, uh, you know, sort of blind almost, you know, do, do, did you work very closely with the stereographer to, to explain what was going on? Yeah, I mean, again, I never wanted to lose sight of the script and 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 so this was kind of enhancement um the only things we did differently really um sky kindly gave us a little bit more time to achieve the 3d effects that we wanted um looking back on it i maybe um sometimes filming expands to the time you have available and and i think probably if, if we'd have been under real pressure we may be able to have done it in in, in the three days that the other crackers uh achieved in but we we're very grateful because of that learning curve to have another day to uh, to achieve it. So we had a, the pressure was off a little bit in that respect. Um, we had a lot of night shooting, as you can see from that. And I think um, in terms of learning curve, I learned a lot about uh, perhaps what I didn't know was about some of the restrictions and some of the advantages and disadvantages of shooting 3D at night. Um, uh, but it really, I just approached it pretty much like a normal film shoot um, with this kind of added. Added dimension. Oh, do you would do you think you'd approach another project in exactly the same way, just 
or, or do you think now yeah. you've done that, you'd um, approach it in a different I mean, way? I mean, I, I loved applying in, in this, you know, I can only talk about this film, Boo, but I, I mean, I think comedy in, in a way is a, is a form of heightened reality. And so I think that applying 3D to that is a really clever trick, if that's the right word. Um, but I think in, a, in, in addition to that, we had these elements of, of kind of spooky, ghosty moments. And, and there's no doubt that, you know, we've seen 3D be applied to, you know, athletes, wildlife, ghosts. There's a, there's a list of things which 3D seems to really fit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think actually in this case, in this story, there were elements of this story that actually really were enhanced by, by filming them in, in 3D. So that was a huge... Mm. Huge bonus for us well, to be able to do that. We were talking about this earlier. I was talking about this earlier with Saskia. What, um, you know, we, we hear a lot about how 3D enhances drama and, and tension. Um, how did you find it enhanced the comedy? Or did you find it enhanced the comedy? Well, I think, like I said before, because it was a kind of heightened reality. I mean, Lily Savage is, is pretty scary on a, on a normal day, and Lily <laughs> Savage in 3D was like super scary. Um, and we always had that, you know, that shot in mind of Lily Savage looming at us out of the screen. Um, we didn't want to do it in a way that distorted it, but actually, you know, just became more scary. And I think 3D applied to that particular sequence makes it uh, a more effective, um, a more potent scene because of the application 3D. Mm -hmm. Did uh, it would have worked in 2D, but yeah. actually, I think it was just like better in 3D. Yeah. Did uh, um, Mustafa and, and Damon? Did you find that it? the 3D help the comedy as well as the... I would, yeah, I would say counterintuitively would have, you know, I wouldn't have thought that it would actually. I, I, going into this, I thought this would be a really interesting experiment. I'd love to learn a bit more about the technology and it was a fantastic sort of, you know, offer from Sky to, you know, part fund that element of it. So that, you know, for all those reasons, it was, it was a relatively hard sell, I'd say, to the director because Sharon Hawken, who wrote it, directed it and she was a first time director, so she was, you know, she was quite nervous about the idea of having to tackle the technology aspect of it. But I think, in a, you know, we kind of reversed roles. As I was the exec producer, but I'd say to her, let, let me worry about the, the technical and you just worry about the story. And if there's anything I think you need to worry about, then, uh, you know, I'll pass that on. But really, the DOP took that on board and just, you know, really got his hands dirty in the technology and ultimately I guess unlike the other two films you'll see a bit in a minute it's not really a it's not really a sort of genre piece it's not you know it, it's it's a very sort of traditional family comedy uh, you know short and it's so there, there aren't things leaping out at you there aren't those opportunities where you you know so we had to think very carefully about what the 3D was adding to it okay. but what it did add was this sense of I suppose in the more dramatic and emotional moments, you felt like you were there and you were drawn in. And actually, that did heighten the comedy because mm. there's a big scene in a front room with the family or where it all kicks off. And, you know, it just felt yeah. much more alive and you felt more drawn in. And, and I was really surprised at that when I watched it. I thought the end, the end effects were, were really, really impressive. Well, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, f I think just the very nature of 3D, it's, it's immersive. Yeah. You know, for the viewer, you're immersed in, 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 in that world. You know, even more so because you have depth, you know, you have uh, spatial awareness and, and, that, and the way you shoot it definitely shifts and therefore your perspective shifts. So I think uh, just by its very nature, that immersive nature, it, it, it does, uh, you know, it does connect with you more, I, I think. Mm. Uh, well, let's uh, see the last scene. This is from, uh, this is from your film. Uh, can you okay. give a bit of a... What's the, uh, what's the story behind this one? Well, the story, this is, Sharon, again, this is based on sort of real events in Sharon's childhood, but it was a story, she, she grew up on a, a turkey farm, small turkey farm in Ireland, and that meant that every Christmas, uh, yeah, it wasn't, it's not a mechanical operation. I learned a lot about turkey plucking, but basically a lot of locals would come from her town to her farm and pluck turkeys, and she used to muck in with the whole family, um, and it's a romantic, sort of love story, coming of age story really, about a, you know, she, a boy that she meets one winter as she's plucking turkeys. Um. <laughs> it's euphemistic. Yes. <laughs> okay, here, take a look at that. Okay, oh, we've got one over here. Hi there, Emily Mann from Creative Skillset. I just had a quick question about whether you'd had any audience responses from the, from the um, work and the I suppose the transition from 2D to 3D as well with... In terms of Sky audiences, do you mean? Yeah. Um, 
Well, we do a lot of detailed feedback at the end of every series, and um, I think that those who have 3D and access to 3D really enjoyed it, and um, I think to, to have some comedy content on the channel was really appreciated. So that sort of fueled our, our ambition to do more, really. But in terms of general feedback, I think, Damon, this is your time to base. Well, Sharon's film, because uh, one of the guy who worked as a stereographer on the movie for Sony, uh, Grant, uh, suggested we put it in for the 3D. What was the award ceremony called? It's a 3D International. Let's call it a 3D Oscars. That's, that's what we're calling it. And, uh, <laughs> which was in, which uh, it, it won the category it was in. It was the International Short Film um, and picked up a prize, which was on the same sort of bill as Ang Lee did an inspirational speech. And yeah. So it's a nice way to start. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Uh, right at the front here. Um, AJ from Gunslinger Films. Um, what were your typical budgets for 3D short and just any other production kind of insight, shooting days, etc.? Um, okay, yeah. A Adrian? Um, for, for, these, for these films? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our budget was around the 200, 200 grand mark. 12 minutes short. Well, it, it, not quite, because there's a, there's a second half of the film that we all made, which was a kind of a documentary about the making of the first half of the film. We filled a better way of thinking about it. We filled half an hour. It was a half hour slot on Sky One, um, which was which around about 200 grand, I think. And you delivered 2D and 3D version. Yeah. Was that the same for both of you, roughly? Yeah, I think the, the, the I think actually. What might be more helpful as the answer is that I think the, the extra on top of what we would have been given if we'd done it on 2D is 2D was probably, what's out about, is it about 50? Is it a bit is less? It, I'm not supposed to comment. I can't remember, probably not allowed to say as I was thinking. But it was, I mean, it, I think it was less than that actually. So 50. I suppose, it, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> it's almost like, you know, we got an extra day, we did have an extra day's filming compared to all the others. So, so budget wise, it wasn't a huge, I, mean, I was surprised that it wasn't a huge cost given the amount of equipment, and, but maybe we were getting that cheaply, who knows. Mm. Yeah, do, do you think a lot of the extra cost was because you were, to a certain extent, experimenting, and if you were Maybe. to do it again, you would, it would cut costs through it taking less time, etc. Well, to be honest, we actually got a huge amount of help from Sony with gear and, and, and stuff, so it, it's, it's a really difficult because it's not really yeah. a true cost. Um, I think if we did it from a kind of a greenfield budget, it would actually probably be more. Rather than less. But interestingly, yeah. I, th I mean, I was anticipating that our sort of slate rate would go down tremendously because we were a new director and b working with you know a, a big rig. Uh, but <laughs> it, actually, we weren't uh, achieving bad rates. I didn't think we were sort of in the end. We were kind of like shooting twenty five slates a day, and which that's comparable to what we were doing without you know three D with experienced directors. And it didn't feel like we were rushed or cutting corners. And I think in a way that's partly the technology dictated a little bit how you shot everything. So we had a lot of track down because the rig's so big, it's hard to do handheld stuff. But it was quite easy to just sort of switch around, you know, and, uh, you know, the track was going down quickly and we were take, getting, making the most out of the angles off those tracks as well. So it did tend to speed the process up. Yeah, we, we, we also had two rigs. Uh, so we didn't have to spend time switching lenses. Uh, we had uh, the long lens rig and the short lens rig. So that, that helped things tremendously. I think there was a concern, you know, uh, having not done 3D, you know, you hear these nightmare stories of, oh my God, it's going to be a nightmare. But actually it wasn't. I, I've had more problems on a 2D, 2D shoot, uh, on a red, to be honest. Uh, no offense to anybody here who likes red. Um, you know, Alexa all the way. But, um, you know, it, it was actually really, really, really smooth. And I think we only had one little uh, hiccup, and, and, and that only was a few minutes. So uh, I found it really smooth and fast, actually. It didn't delay anything, especially for my shoot. You know, I was working with kids, you know, working with kids, is, you're, you're consumed by four hours a day with kids in front of the camera, and you can only shoot, like, it's not like Hollyoaks where you shoot 50 pages a day. You could, uh, you could only, that was a joke, uh, you could only shoot, uh, like, three and a half, uh, just because of time, and you shoot action as well, so it's really tight. And uh, it didn't affect that at all, actually. Did you find the equipment restrictive in, in any sense, or is it? Well, we, we, we had these big rigs, because just by the nature, you know, well, there's one camera, coming down and another camera going this way. But for us, uh, I, I shot in a hospital in Hemel Hempstead, uh, 
which is like LA. Uh, and uh, it was it, no problems at all, you know, no problems at all. It's just that small space. You, like, we had some quite small rooms to take shots from. And, uh, you know, it is a bit, you know, obviously there's a lot more rig there. So some of those, in, in small rooms, some of those shots are a bit compromised. But in general, I didn't think, it, you know, mm. one, because of the prep, we'll go back to the first point, because we've been there, seen everything, knew, knew all about these problems. You know, Sony took us on a training day and we saw it in the sky and we saw the rig. It, you know, I think it just, no, I mean, I'd love to be able to sit here and, you know, confirm everyone's worst fears about it, but actually it, 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 it was the complete opposite. I had a you yeah. know, great... It's, it's also interesting because, you know, like I remember five years ago, everyone was worried about HD, you know, oh my God, HD, <laughs> you know, HD cam, HD this, HD that, and here it is, bang, it happened overnight, right? We're all watching HD streaming on YouTube, we all have HD TVs, most of us anyway. And free, it's going to happen in 3D. Honestly, it will. Before you know it, it's mainstream and everyone's got it. I, mm. do, I, I would gladly make the, you know, a series, uh, a sitcom series in half hour. I don't think, you know, I don't think it would be gimmicky. I think it would work uh, for the right project. Uh, yeah. Whereas I could never have imagined saying that <laughs> four months ago. You know, at that, at that point. So I'm a convert. Yes. I mean, so am I. I, I I'm, not, I'm not pitching it to you guys, but uh, I was pitching just asking. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I might as well join in, uh, but, but I would love, I would absolutely love to make a British Ghostbusters in 3D, you know? Let's after, do it. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> after, after, after shooting that and seeing how much fun and how immersive and how interesting and how engaging of an audience can be, you know, that will get your ass out of the house on a Sunday and into the cinemas, you know? That's going to be, that's a lot of fun. And I think that's what we're missing. And I think uh, just generally in, in British film, and uh, I think uh, it has the power to do that, you know. And that's why, you know, you know, a lot of uh, uh, films for family audiences, and which, which has lots of comedy in, uh, are three D, you know. Mm. Well, I mean, f films like Ghostbusters, I guess that's the ones you'd immediately think about if somebody said, "Let's do a film in three D." I mean, would it work for something like, I don't know, a, a grittier sort of uh, fish tank or? I don't know, man. Party, you're, you're, you're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I don't know. You know, it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because it, I think not. You know, auteurs and and filmmakers. You know, from a sp you know from that kind of European cinema. You know, are kind of very anti 3D, aren't they? You know, but uh, until they experiment with it uh, and and play around with it, and you know, David Lynch is just experimenting with digital now. You know, it's uh, it, it could be interesting. You know, imagine mm. watching To the Wonder in 3D and, and how beautiful a spectacle that might and could be, mm -hmm. you know, who knows? Uh, but, you know, it's definitely open to, to us all to, uh, to experiment and play with and have fun with it. And I don't know if necessarily everybody would say, you know, Ghostbusters, first thing that will come to your mind. Oh, yeah. You yeah. Know, that's, you know, uh, you know, that's, you know, uh, a lot of the filmmakers I know, they wouldn't go near that with a barge pole, but, you really? know, I love that, so, yeah. yeah. Well, aren't they still trying to get the Ghostbusters 3? Oh, we're going off course. <laughs> um, so, um, Ang Lee, just before, leading on from what you were saying, I think he finished on a comment that nobody knows anything about 3D, and uh, yeah. you know anyone who says they, says they do are, uh, are lying. Um, yeah, I agree, yeah. yeah. With, I, I, with, I, I mean, I'd love to see now you know, some more dramatic pieces, not genre flicks. You know, I, it's, it's just not been done and uh, there's parts of me just you know I, I yeah I've, I've completely changed my thinking on it and I'd really like to see a conventional comedy which didn't you know rely on you know being a genre movie or an effects movie and see see how that worked mm. Mm. so do you, you had a lot of uh, freedom in terms of what you could do with uh, with the 3d you know, it wasn't you know, you say yeah, you, you do so many meetings, was it, oh, this is how it's got to work? No, this is I think that was what I was worried about, that prescriptive nature because of the technology. But actually, what would happen if, you're, in, if you're, you're, you're shooting a scene and you really want to take the shot, which isn't going to work for 3D because there are lots of, obviously, rules about, you know, if you've got things on the edge of screen, it can, yeah. you know, make mm -hmm. it look all a bit wonky. Uh, and I, uh, but, you know, what Grant, our stereographer, would do is just, I'll just turn down the convergence a bit. I'll just make this a bit flatter. And this, this because that shot's beautiful, I understand why you want to get it, and we'll go for that. It doesn't, it's like not every shot has to, you know, make you think, whoa, I'm in the room. And mm. so, you know, when it works and it's subtle, it's, it can be, you know, quite beautiful, I think. I, I definitely think if Kubrick was around today, he would be all over that, oh, yeah. definitely. You know, look at these films, they're all, so, all about space. 
and the way he shoots an alignment, you know, he would be on that like uh, like nobody's business. But have you become a bit of the kind of like three D bore now when you're seeing three D films? <laughs> and going, oh, and that bit doesn't work now because there's a book at the front of the screen that's really I d out. I, I don't know you. Know. Just me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just you. <laughs> Do we have a last question? Oh, down here. Is, are there any other questions before? Okay, last question. Hi, um, I'm Gabby Anderson, Eric Yassi from Carpolation in France. Um, and so we are, we are um, 3D uh, content producers, so we've been doing um, uh, stuff for about 10 years now. And every time we try to do, um, to do um, a narrative content on a series mode, a little bit not what, what you did, which is absolutely brilliant, by the way. Um, quickly, when we did one, two, three, maybe five, up to five episodes, it was fine because we took every episode as almost an experiment or an independent shot movie and, and when it came to let's try to make it a series of, of 20 or 30 episodes, suddenly the, the numbers or, or, or time spent and were, were so different from the 2D that it became a real issue. Um, how do you, do you imagine the future of, of Little Crackers on a, on a long term, like beyond, beyond those three, three or five tests? Well, I think um, our ambition is to try and do a, say, a six-part sitcom as 3D. And as I said, it's, it's a huge learning curve for us at the moment. So you know much more about it than I do. And I think it will be, it'll be a, a, a real sort of learning experience for us. But I think our aim is to sort of try and start on the smaller projects and then grow with it in terms of our experience and understanding of it. Um, so although we have big 3D ambitions, I think we're going to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and maybe we do occasional one-off um, narratives or two-parters, and, and I think those will be interesting for 3D as well, just purely for the practical reasons that you've described. Um, I'd just like to finish on, on one thing, actually. If you could now, having gone through your project, go back and tell yourself something when you started, this one piece of information that you've learned that you think is most useful, what, what would that be? Uh, for me, I, I, I think on a, a technical level, I would question the cameras we used. I, I, I think looking back, actually, we could have used better cameras. And I, I would do a little bit more research, a few more tests into the type of camera we used. I, I would have to agree. Uh, you know, I'm not just taking the easy route out. Uh, I, you know, I think, you know, shooting an LX or something with, uh, you know, a, a more beautiful picture frame, a stronger picture frame, uh, would 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 have enhanced uh, the story in, in the 3D as well, and and just on the end on 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 the back of that, um, I think we're all here telling stories. You know, all these films about stories. You know, we're not here trying to sell you know 3D. It wasn't. It was never about that. It was always 3D serving the story, and I think uh, you know that you know I know I know uh, you mentioned that time and time again, and I think uh, you know if you if you always go back to the story and serve the story. That's all it's ever been about, you know? Thanks. That's it. Sorry. Do you agree with that? I agree with all of that. I'd probably, <laughs> I think I'd have probably, well, I'd, I'd tell myself now that uh, dead turkeys start to smell a bit after <laughs> oh, right. two days. They really, they don't smell nice. So I think about that. Um, I just, yeah, I, I, I'd say just don't be, don't be, if, don't be so afraid. Don't be so afraid. Of it. You know, just open your mind a little bit. I, I you know, I could have been more open-minded uh, going into it. I think, and the pro, and that's why I tell myself, don't worry about it, because actually, it's exactly what Mustafa said. Still, it doesn't. As long as, as long as you are acknowledging, you know, what this technology can do towards your storytelling, rather than trying to push your storytelling into a, you know, into the technology, I think yeah. you'll be fine. I think it's. And actually, it didn't feel, to be honest, apart from having to deal with a stereographer or, or chat to a stereographer <laughs> all day, uh, which was very nice, uh, the, uh, the process wasn't incredibly different to how we normally made things. So. Oh, well, uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up, but thank you very much, and I um, hope you enjoy the rest of the couple of days. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.